You're listening to the Champions Rugby Show with me, Martin Hindley. Today we're fortunate enough to have a treat from West Wales, where Clanethley famously once beat the All Blacks and the World Champion Australians. And now this man takes the Scarlets these days into battle against all comers in Europe. Lovely top ball, Ken Owen still going, Ken Owen for the line! And the hooker come back low, smashes his way over, and look what that means to him! He captained Scarlets to an amazing European Cup run just two years ago, helping them to reach the semi-finals. He's won a record number of caps for a Welsh hooker, and he's one of the most respected figures in the sport. Joining me today is the Scarlets, Wales and Lions star, Ken Owens. Ken, thanks for coming on the Champions Rugby Show. How are you getting on these days? Yeah, not too bad. It's uh, it's obviously uh, interesting in lockdown at the moment, but um, no, it's been good to have uh, time at home uh, with the family and um, yeah, just having a, a rest from the game, which uh, we don't tend to have too often. So it's quite nice. We mentioned those games back at Stratty Park in the intro. They're so famous in the, the history of the sport. As we go back through your career to date in the European Cup, when you first pulled on that jersey, knowing the kind of heroes whose footsteps you were following in, uh, what kind of, of emotions did that bring to you at the, at the start of your career? That's quite surreal, actually. Um, I was lucky enough, uh, my first full season with the Scarlets, we had a great team at the time. Um, I was only 19 and had my opportunity uh, on the bench. And uh, we had a great uh, European Cup run that year, uh, which took us to uh, the semi-finals against Leicester. But it had only been two or three years before I'd been um, uh, working as a security guard um, for my mate, uh, my mate's company to you know, earn a little bit of extra money on a couple of big European games and just seeing the atmosphere. And then obviously growing up, watching... Um, some big European moments. I went to the, the semi-final in Red in when we narrowly lost to um, Northampton. And, uh, you know, watching the other big games is sort of what um, Scarlet's history has been bred on as, uh, has been the European Cup. And I think however you go through your, your Scarlet's career, you, you're basically judged on what you've done in Europe. And I think um, that's probably the biggest impression had on me. And I think that first year brought it back home to how much it means to everybody. And, you know, just just excited to be part of it and, and having that opportunity earlier on, early on in my career to go on a, on a cup run like that. The first time I went to Clenethley, Ken, you get off the train, you see the car win James Pub, you're immediately hit with uh, the history uh, of the jersey in the town. How, how difficult was it for you not to be overawed walking into that dressing room with, with some of the characters that were in there at the time? Oh, I was, um, yeah, like I said, probably surreal. Um, I, I remember I'd, been involved the season before and, and sort of these guys I'd looked up to I was lucky enough I knew a couple of them because obviously lived in the in the local area down in uh, sort of Kamarth in West Wales and it's quite a close-knit community so like your cousin is used to go to school with Stephen Jones and things like that so you do get to know some of them but you know it was unbelievable I think just you know being able to rub shoulders with your heroes and then to be part of it and I think the type of region it is um, you're, you're always welcomed in almost instantaneously especially if you buy into the, the culture and what, what the region's about. It's, uh, uh, you're almost like a lifelong friend of, of, of Scarlet's rugby by doing that. And I think I was, I was overawed, but, but quickly got taken. I was the youngest in the squad and, and the oldest member of the squad, John Davis, uh, quickly took me under, under his wing and, you know, and, and looked after me, basically. So there's like, so him, Dav Jones, um, Stephen Jones, Dwayne Peel. These guys were my heroes, but because we're from the same area, very, very quickly became my friends, which, uh, you know, always helps. Clenethley as a club was was almost a region before regions exist, as we, we look back a, a long time now in history. As you were going through that first campaign that you mentioned that you were a part of, really, in the Heineken Cup, did you feel that you were doing something, you were making steps, not only for Clenethley Scarlets, but also for Welsh rugby? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's always interesting because I'm from Carmarthen, I am. So there's a, there's always been an interesting rivalry uh, between Slatley and Carmarthen. And uh, so that's always been a fun one. And and for me, you know, I wasn't a huge Slatley supporter growing up. I was a, I was a Carmarthen athletic boy at, at heart. And that was my club, even though we were Division 4 or 5 in the Welsh leagues back then. So for me, it was interesting. I obviously enjoyed watching Slatley play because of the brand of rugby and, and everything that came with it. And but my main affinity came with the region was when it when it 
truly became a, a region. It meant so much to me to represent my my area that I've grown up in, and obviously the Welsh language history, which is which is huge um, to the region as well, which it, it sort of thrives on. Um, you you got people from all over Wales who probably have an affinity to the Scarlet and Slatty because of the Welsh language link as well. So in that in that first year, um, we've obviously the Scarlet and Slatty have been the flag bearers in Europe for for Wales, um, probably been the highest achievers up until that point. And I think for me, I did feel some sort of responsibility to to keep adding to the to the history of Slatty and and the Scarlet and 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 continuing that. And and like I said, because we'd been the most successful team over the years. And regularly, you know, in quarterfinals and semi-finals and things like that, it was uh, it, it was a certain responsibility that we felt we owed everybody. I think it was the first time uh, since the inception of regional rugby that we'd we'd qualified uh, for a quarterfinal as well. So that that was a big moment. And not only qualified, but qualified, winning all six matches, home and away to Ulster, to London Irish, and to Toulouse as well, who at the time were already three-time European champions. That's some achievement, and must have been quite hard after doing all of that to then prepare yourself for Munster uh, in a quarterfinal who had been at the business end of the European Cup quite regularly as well. I mean, uh, there's there's quite a lot of achievements there for a first season in, in the European Cup for you. Oh, it was. I think... Um... We were playing a good brand of rugby. We we were going okay in the league. I think probably the two big turning points were were to lose at home. Our discipline that day was was absolutely fantastic. I think we only gave away one penalty and um, and got a great result. I think Toulouse were were up there with the um, uh, the favourites that season. I think going out to Toulouse, we had the the half twelve kick off the week after um, an early one, and I think we were thirty odd points down at half time. And luckily, Dav James scored a try right on half time, which sort of kept us in the game and we just probably took the pressure off a little bit um, and we, we just started playing and played some absolutely fantastic rugby and and that sort of kick-started our, our run that year and um, or gave us a, a huge amount of confidence and then once we won the six from six qualifying the group we got Munster which was, we know is always a, a massive game with their European pedigree and the quality stars that they've got and I think um, it's the first time I've ever seen Stradley Park like it uh, as a, a player as my first season but the the rafters absolutely full. I think we had they had put seventeen marquees up with tellies in for people to watch because there's just everybody trying to get to the game. I think if it could have been, it'd have been going back to seventy two and they'd have let forty or fifty thousand people into the place if they could have. But you know, we knew the challenge that was there, but everything went right for us that day. We we played some outstanding stuff. We were right on edge, and it it was meant to be that day, and we we got a fant- a, a huge result against a quality, quality side. Back on the attack, the Scarlets, Davis, knowing that one score will probably do it. King to Jones, Mark Jones, nearly through the gap. That's a lovely ball, McLeod, on it goes, Barry Davis! The Scarlets are surely now going to a semi-final. Is it destined to be their year? You mentioned 72, obviously beating the Australians. People from the outside, like like us, often put quite a lot of emphasis on on moments in history. As players, do you ever, when you when you beat Monster in that kind of atmosphere, do you ever get the sense? Are you ever able to get the sense that you've achieved something really special that might one day rank alongside those kind of things? It doesn't at the time. Um, I think probably the only time it, it hit home for me, what we'd achieved that night, you know, in uh, Scarless European history was probably five or six or seven years of playing in the in the competition and, and not getting to the the top tier competitions quarterfinal stages and I think it showed how difficult it is to do that and what an achievement that was and I think when we got to 2017-2018 season when we went on the run and, and qualified and then ended up playing La Rochelle that's where I kept saying to the players I've I'd been around a long long time at that point um, and I was the only player uh, from that current squad who was uh, who'd played back in 2007, 2008 season, I think it was. And, and I, I think that showed the magnitude of the challenge and the achievement it was to get out of the group, especially from a Scarlet's perspective. And uh, and I, I think that's when it really did dawn on uh, what an achievement that was back back then. We know that you've been speaking to, to Keith Wood about a, a real classic match at Parky Scarlet's then in, in January 2018 in, in that round six game that took you through to the, the quarterfinals. Uh, I was at the reverse game of that uh, to Felix Mayol and after a slow start really, 
you gave the three-time European champions an absolute pasting for the for the next hour. Um, even though you lost the game, that performance must have given you quite a lot of heart amid the disappointment of losing by by a point. No, it did. We, we were hugely frustrated. I think uh, we played Toulon. I think the season before, maybe the season before that, and we got a, a really good win at home uh, against them. And I think that gave us a little bit of confidence. And then we went out there and. A couple of things have gone differently. We we could have got the result, and I think that showed we could go to the tough places to go in Europe and and get results. Uh, we obviously knew we needed to be a little bit more clinical, but I think that gave us massive confidence. And although we didn't back it up the week after in the rain against Bath by by losing that game uh, with a with a four or five day turnaround, you know it was um, it was a game changer for us as a squad to go look. We can compete at this level and get get the job done, and and it, it did. Give us huge belief within the in the squad. It didn't show it straight away because obviously we lost the the week after, like I said, against Bath, but got a bon- uh, losing bonus point, and then the back to back against Treviso, we scraped through in the home game. But then by some couple of moments of brilliance, you need a bit of luck in the in the competition at all times, uh, and we definitely rode it that year. But I think from from that Treviso home game on, we were almost faultless. We went to Treviso and were were absolutely impeccable out there for four tries got the job done and the, and then everything was in our hands then i think a good away win in bath and then obviously um Toulon at home and um we knew they they were in the hunt uh, as were we and i think um if anything we it was our error which which kept them in the game and um we could have been some more scores ahead uh, but it just showed a bit of everything from our squad that we could play play rugby uh, entertain the crowd and obviously dig in and scramble and I put a her- heroic defensive effort in, which um, which held us in good stead for the later stages of the tournament. Here comes Ken Owens, and then it's Asquith. Said he was enjoying it. Gareth Davis to Jones. They're all enjoying it, and why wouldn't you? The Pro 12 now 14 champions ripping it up in Europe. That game against Bath, it absolutely hammered down in, in Clenethley that night. And after that, it became virtually knockout rugby. Um, obviously, it's pretty much knockout rugby when you play in the Six Nations. There's very little margin for error. But I just wanted to, for, for that specific group of, of Scarlet's players, how important were the successes that you'd come through to lift the, the Pro 12 trophy when it came to, to really having a, a knockout round mentality? Because when you look back on what you achieved in the Pro 12 to lift that trophy, that was something pretty exceptional at the at the business end of that tournament. No, it was. Um, that season we'd lost, I think it was three or four of the first games of the season. And... Uh, so we went through that that season pretty much having to play knockout rugby. I remember after we lost to Edinburgh away, and the, our analysis uh, keeps reminding me of this. It was quite late, uh, as you can imagine. We just lost, and a couple of beers had been drunk. And we were discussing it, and and I just turned to and I turned to him and I said, "The thing is, we we win the next uh, eighteen games on the bounce, and no one will say anything because we we have picked up the league." <laughs> and uh, after we won the trophy, we won the won uh, the final, beat beat Munster. He turned to me, he said, "You got it wrong." He said we went 17 on the bounce, and I was like, "That's a fantastic achievement." And we we did really galvanise a lot of youngsters came through. And I think um, I was got they got got injured um, in the training week leading up to the semi final, so I, I I couldn't be involved in them last two games. But sitting at home watching the the semi final, and you know we started absolutely on fire, got the points on the board, and got a red card, which put us under a lot of pressure. You so no team had had won um, an away semi final, uh, and then. You go into probably the best team in the league, in if not in Europe, and you get a red card, and you're, you're instantly under pressure. And I thought, you know, the character of the squad uh, to go there, get an away win down to 14 men, in in the manner which we did as well, gave us massive heart for the season after. And I think John Barkley probably said said a thing leading up to the final. He said, "You don't want to be a side that goes, oh, we got to lose a final to win a final. Let's just go out and win it now. Why do you need that experience?" And I thought that that really resonate with the boys and they were just themselves that day against Munster and, and played you know fantastic rugby got the job then won won the league and I think that's that was our mentality the the season after with it with our European run especially 
Well, you you beat Toulon uh, in front of a, a terrific crowd, which at the time was a, was a Scarlet's record in European competition. Then you went and beat that record in the quarterfinal. I remember Neris working in the the comms department, running around like crazy, trying to accommodate the interest. The town was buzzing on Good Friday for a game against against La Rochelle, and you get over the line. What are your memories uh, of of that experience and just how the town completely? built around the stadium that day. It was something quite incredible. I was probably best described by uh, Phil Bennett when he said after the game, he, he said, we'd been at uh, Parker Scarless about 10 or so years. And he said, Parker Scarless finally found its soul today. And I think um, that that's that's what happened. Um, you know, it was the first time we'd had a big European day in West Wales for over a decade and the first at uh, Parker Scarless. And I think that, that sums up what the European Cup means to to us in West Wales, and and I, I, it was it was unbelievable. It was the first time I remember when we built the stadium. They said, "Oh, we're able to put extra seat in behind the posts um, uh, for the big games," and that's the first time they went in. So that uh, that was that was quite an interesting moment for us. But I could, I probably have never had so many phone calls for tickets um, as I have since uh, the two thousand and seven cup run, and I, it was it was just great. I you you get. You know, people who've perhaps never been interested in rugby or even scarless rugby showing an interest in the local community. And I, I think it definitely had a, an effect on bringing people's imagination and um, and enjoyment back to, you know, West West Wales rugby. And it was it was huge. And the game, I actually, funnily enough, watched it back last night. It popped up and um, we probably didn't play our best rugby that day. We we over we overforced it. We tried playing too wide and, and we weren't, and I flew with best until probably the 75th minute or so. But what summed it up for me was the atmosphere in the stadium, what, what it's about, you know, getting the crowd behind you. And we took our chances when, when they were there. La Rochelle played some, you know, outstanding rugby on the night, but I thought our determination, our, our hunger to, to get that result, you know, Lee Halfpenny was was on the money with the, with the kick in. Um, and we didn't actually have to overplay in the end. We, we could just be a little bit more pragmatic and, and get the result. And I think that, that showed probably how we'd grown as a squad as, as well. Patchell, Shingler, Davis, brilliant, Scott Williams, chasing across and chasing home for what will surely be a European Cup semi-final place. And how do those experiences on days like that, not just the atmosphere, but the, the pressure and that knockout feel, how does that then feed back into you as a, as a player? How has it developed you over time to be the player that you've been on 77 times more than any other hooker for, for the national team? I mean, how, how, how has it developed you to play in, in Europe? Like you said, it's, it's knockout rugby. Um, I think probably playing at the international stage, one thing you, you get no pre quickly there's no hiding place you've got massive crowds people looking at you and I think until last season the season before uh, we we hadn't been used to having massive crowds at, at the Scarlet's which is probably fair to say and you know uh, bar some local derbies and I think um, the more them experiences the boys got obviously the expectation goes up which you're used to at international level but the more you play in them atmospheres and them arenas it all, it does help you because you you can just ex- accept the expectation and uh, and the responsibility and it, it just becomes the norm and I think that's why when you spoke about Munster and Leinster and Sars at these teams it's the big days but they've it, they've managed to make it the norm and just be used to it and I think we had a lot of international experience in that side some probably young players who are a little bit naive and just want to go out and play rugby and enjoy the moment which is brilliant and then we had a lot of experience around them with a lot of international experience Lions experience and and that, and that real balance, um, you know, helped the squad. And I think then how we grew that um, on our league run the year before to win the league. And then that really came to the fore in the next season as we went round and round and round and built that momentum. And the, and the boys just got used to feeding off it and really enjoying it. When rugby returns, Scarlets will have a quarterfinal in the other European competition, the, the Challenge Cup in the, the Felix Mayol against Toulon. Is it for you an ambition to to lift that European trophy at the end of this season? Oh, it is. It's, um, I, I had a, a conversation with Brad Moore when he f- first came over, and I said, um, uh, "What's our plan for the year? Are we um, 
taking competitions they're very targeted what's the sort of conversation being with the board and it's like i'm I'm here to win everything and i said fine happy days that's that's what we're going to do then and and we put ourselves in that position to you know we got a, a quarter final uh in europe we done it the hard way again but um no we, we gained some huge conference i think we've learned a lot obviously being with the new coaching and management staff that time they they've learned a lot and i think um you know we're in a really good place to to really kick on now with the boys about a good break, hopefully uh, an eight-week block of training now once we get back in and then some regional derbies uh, to really ramp up and be ready to go for, for that European um, quarterfinal. And, and, you know, I know it's the, the Challenge Cup, but it's still a European trophy and it's something, you know, that the Scarlets haven't done yet is is winning the European competition and it's, it's definitely right at the forefront of our minds to, um, to lift that trophy and then all being well, being back in the Champions Cup next year, and uh, we'll still be driving to uh, to be uh, hopefully trying to lift that trophy the season after. Ken, you mentioned Brad, and obviously you worked with Wayne before that, and a number of uh, of leaders of players when you came into into the club at the start of your career. You're clearly a leader on whichever pitch you get to, whether it's representing Scarlets, Wales, or the Lions. Who do you take most inspiration from as a as a leader on the field? I've I've been lucky enough to play uh, with some great players and learned a lot from them. You know, they speak of Sarah Zalin, Wynn, Sam, and learned a lot from Simon Easterby, both as a, a player as a, and a coach. He's my captain when I first started at the Scarlet, uh, and then obviously went into the coaching and, and learned a lot lot from him, um, especially about the region and what what it means. But I think Wayne was um, a massive influence me. I'll probably take my 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 next step from uh, just being. Um, sort of a player within a team to really stepping up to, to that next level as a, as a leader and a captain. I think he was the first person who, who gave me that responsibility. Uh, you know, other people said, oh, you know, you need to become more of a leader. You need to be a bit more vocal. I was not always given the opportunity to do that. And I think uh, it made me his captain as soon as he came in and didn't always get everything right. Um, but I think as I've grown over the years and probably he's, he's had a, a massive in, impact on that, in taking my game to the next level by giving me that confidence and um, I'm becoming a natural in the way I try and lead and conduct myself on the field. I mentioned at the the start of this interview the the Carwin James pub. If you lift the Challenge Cup this season, will we will we see in Clenethley a, a Ken Owens pub? Will we be able to have a pint there? I'm not sure. I'm not sure <laughs> if, uh, if they will. There may be. Hopefully there'll be some in. But no, I, d- I don't think so. I think, you know, what uh, Carwin achieved both for the Slatty um, and, and Wales and the Lions, you know what I mean? He's, uh, he's an absolute legend and, um, you know, I'm I'm not one for them sort of accolades. I'm just, uh, I'm happy to, to lift the trophy up, uh, have a couple of beers with the boys after the game and then head back down to Carmarthen or, or down to Dav Jones's um, pub in the village and have a, a couple of quiet beers with him like I did after the, the La Rochelle game. Well, Ken, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to go down memory lane with you about the, the European Cup history. We know that you've got plenty more chapters to write, and when rugby returns, uh, we look forward to watching you write them. Thank you so much for joining us on the, the Champions Rugby Show, Ken. Perfect. Thank you very much. Some top-class insights there into the history of the Scarlets in what is now the Heineken Champions Cup from the Scarlets, Wales and Lions hooker Ken Owens about the magic of Straddy Park and the people who's turned him into the leader that we know today, not only for his region, but also on 77 occasions, no less, for his country. Please subscribe and rate our Champions Rugby Show podcast. Drop us a little review if you liked it as well. We've got another European legend coming up shortly to tell you their unique story from a quarter of a century of history in Club Rugby's finest tournament. Until then, from me and all the team, goodbye.